as we read it, look out for words of comfort and encouragement at the beginning and the end of the reading. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling. In the desert prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, uh, what, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up, do not be afraid. Say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you very much, George. Chapter 40 of Isaiah, verse 1, I'm going to read again. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Sometimes I ask the children at home what subjects they have for school each day. It's a good day if it's drama, it's a bad day if it's maths or history. Today's subject is comfort. Uh, the comfort of God. I guess the world's in short supply of comfort just at the minute um, as we prayed even so contemporarily with the issues of today. You probably felt that a little bit. We could do with some comfort on the international stage, relations with the US and Iran, for example. We could do with some comfort that it's still okay to fly on a Boeing 737. Uh, we could do some comfort, if you will like that royal family, that there's some future for them or whatever it might be. You could think of the same need for the church today, the church at large, the Christian people across the world. We could do with some comfort that the gospel really does change lives. It doesn't seem to be doing much as you look out sometimes. Um, you could do with some comfort that there is some growth in the country at large in the gospel. But you could probably do with some comfort for yourself. My guess is you would be glad for some comfort about your future, your health, the well-being of your family, any number of very personal things. The question is, how does it come? Where can I get it? How do you get this comfort? Because in Isaiah 40, God clearly wants his people to have it. In which case, where can you get it? Um, Isaiah 40, probably the biggest junction in the big book, that is the prophet Isaiah, chapter 1 to 39, has mostly been about God and his people failing to trust him. And he's warned them that if they don't trust him, then they're going to get into serious trouble. Um, there's a summary verse, which I think is useful, you, lots of summary verses actually in 1 to 39, but just turn back in Isaiah to chapter 7, uh, while you're still fresh. 
page 691, chapter 7, verse 9. Right at the last lines of that page, chapter 7 and verse 9, halfway through, God says to his people, if you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. If you don't stand firm in trusting me, then you're not going to stand at all. And so back in 3940, that big junction that we've just had read in terms of chapter 40, you get to 39... And the judgment is announced that they're not going to stand. Just have a look at verses 6 and 7 of chapter 39. The time will surely come when everything in your palace, says God to Hezekiah, and all that your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood who will be born to you, will be taken away. They'll become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. There is the judgment. If you were in home group last term, you may remember in God's big picture, that big overview of the Bible, the big Bible event in the Old Testament of the exile. There's the rescue from Egypt, that's a big event. And then the exile, the big judgment. And God's people, as if sort of nationally kidnapped Here's a map to show you how it might work out. There's Judah down there, and they're taken into exile by Babylon all the way over here to Babylon, the Babylon Empire sprawling across the world at that time. And that's where they end up. That's what Isaiah has announced in chapter 39. And he's writing, you remember, 100 plus years before that event happens. Um, but he writes to prepare them so that when it happens, they're not phased, and to help them through the time when they are in exile. So chapter 40, God gives Isaiah a very different sounding message from 1 to 39, a very different tone because it's a message of hope. To say to the people, look, exile doesn't mean that God's rejected you forever. Here is a message, Isaiah 40 to 55, you might say, that will keep you trusting in God while you live in the disaster that is going to be the exile. Uh, just imagine, if you can, what it might be like living in a foreign land belonging to your enemies. And that would be a tough thing, wouldn't it? People speaking a very different language, worshipping very different gods, having very different standards, living for very different priorities. And it seems like your God isn't very powerful. It seems like your God doesn't really care for you. That's life in exile. So we don't really have to imagine it. <laughs> New Testament says that's exactly what it's like for Christians. They live as if in exile. A world where people have different priorities and different standards. And your God seems weak and sometimes it doesn't seem like he cares for you. And so to those people of God, there's this message of great, great comfort. Chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort. Comfort my people, says your God. It's a pleasant idea, isn't it? Comfort. Um, some of you may even have some fabric conditioner in your home by the same name. Uh, don't think fabric conditioner. Uh, and don't think, kind of, um, put your onesie on, sit with a mug of cocoa in front of the hot fire either. It's not sort of a life of ease. That's not what comfort is here. The English word literally means with strength. And that's more like what it is here. It is to breathe into people to give them strength. So don't think life of ease. Think life-giving strength from God. That's exactly what you need if you're living in exile. When everyone seems so different, when your God seems so weak, you need plenty of life-giving strength. And through 1 to 11, as we've just had read, God's going to give four reasons why the people of God, Christians today, have life-giving strength. We'll do the first three fairly briefly, and then a bit more on the fourth one. So comfort for these reasons. The first reason is because sin is paid for. Look at verse 2. Speak tenderly. To Jerusalem. That's a, a lover speaking to his beloved 
other half. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she's received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Her hard service, her warfare, if you like, is finished. A payment for sin has been provided, and she's received from the Lord's hand literally a, a doublet. That doesn't mean they've had more than is fair for their sins. It means it's a payment exactly matching their sin, a doublet. And that's come from the Lord's hand. You need to remember that today, don't you? Payment for sin doesn't come from a church or from a clergyman. It doesn't come from yourself. It's from the Lord. It's the only place you can get payment for sin, from God himself. So they're the people in exile. They hear this. Sin is paid for. Maybe they're scratching their heads. How on earth is sin paid for? Even if they were to read on in, in, in Isaiah's scroll, they may have got to chapter 53. They may have read about a servant of the Lord. And that would have been great to read. Punishment for our iniquities is upon a servant. Staggering. But who's he? And we know, of course, that the Lord Jesus is the servant who pays, who is the way that sin is paid for, ultimately. And in Luke's gospel, there's a, a godly man, you may remember, called Simeon. And uh, one of the ways that Simeon is described in Luke chapter 2 is he is someone who was waiting for the consolation of Israel or waiting for the comfort of Israel. And when Simeon then holds Jesus in his arms, he says to God, now I've seen your salvation. Sin is paid for. It's by Jesus Christ. And God says that is the, the mainstay of your comfort. That is the main thing which gives you life-giving strength in the world. As you live in the world and you work in the world and you make your plans and you socialize, the most important backdrop of your life is this. Your sin is paid for. Really sort of trivial um, example of this. I was playing squash recently, um, not well, and um, I was getting a bit frustrated. Sorry, I was getting very frustrated. I was very cross with my opponent, quite unreasonably. He was better than me. It was a very sad day. Um, and this isn't meant to sound pious, but I remember distinctly, as he was about to serve again, I suddenly had this thought, um, long before I was thinking about Isaiah 40, hang on a second, stop getting so stroppy, you're a forgiven person. I didn't play much better, but it made a difference. When all is said and done, that's the big picture. You're a forgiven person. Your sin is paid for. I'm desperately trying to remember which court it was so I can go back and have another mini revelation, but I don't think that's going to happen. The big backdrop of your life is that the sin is paid for. I say that's a trivial example. That is what makes different than non-trivial as well. When exile living hurts and when exile living distresses and makes you despair, that backdrop is the same. There's life-giving strength in knowing that your sin is paid for. Because ultimately, does anything else matter? I ask that carefully. Ultimately, does anything else matter? And sin being paid for, that is the gospel that creates our partnership, as we're thinking about today. Because it's the same for every Christian here. Everyone who is trusting the Lord Jesus, their sin is paid for. And ultimately, nothing else matters. Second reason for comfort over the page, verses 3 to 5. The glory of God is coming. Verse 3 describes an enormous civil engineering project, um, a road being prepared on a vast scale. Do you see in verse 4, every valley shall be raised up, presumably filled in with earth. Uh, every mountain and hill made low, leveled. Rough and rugged places are cleared of debris and obstacles because God is coming. So verse 3, this is a way for the Lord to come. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. He's going to come himself. I don't know if you've watched at this time of year coverage of the Oscars or Golden Globes. I can't, the Oscars haven't happened yet, have they? I can't remember. Uh, we're used to red carpets for important people. 
and they arrive for the stars. This is red carpet arrival times millions and millions. And it's no wonder, verse 5, that the glory of the Lord will be revealed when he comes. It's going to be that momentous an occasion. It's what you'd expect with the arrival of God, a massive public spectacle. It'd be pretty good, I guess, if you're in exile, if God's message was, it's okay, I'm sending help. But this is even better. It's okay, I'm coming to help. God himself is coming. Now, the big moment um, for the people in Babylon when they're allowed back to Jerusalem was obviously a big moment. That's a great relief. You're going home. You can rebuild your lives. But actually, it wasn't long before they realized there wasn't much glory to be seen, even in getting back to Jerusalem, because the returning to the land for them was not the real end of the exile. And as you've read and heard read three to five here, you may think quickly of the gospel accounts of John the Baptist. So each of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as they begin their writing about Jesus, they use these words and put them into the mouth of John the Baptist as he speaks. He is, verse three, the voice. John the Baptist is preparing the way for the Lord Jesus. And the way he prepares is to preach repentance and forgiveness of sins. The glory of the Lord is coming. We know that happens in Jesus Christ. God comes to the world. And God comes to an individual as they, in response to John the Baptist's preaching, repent and believe. And to the person who repents and believes, God comes to that person, as it were. God came to me July 1990 my favorite month of all. And that is part of my comfort. That is my life-giving strength from God. No good any Christian sort of moping around saying, I wish God would come near. If you've repented and believed, he has. He has come to you. And if you repent and believe because you haven't before, he really will. Comfort, comfort, my people, says God. The glory of God is coming. Indeed, he has come in the person of Jesus. Reason three, verses six to eight, the word of God is lasting. I had the satisfying experience recently of taking two very large trailer loads of tree cuttings to the tip. And the things that grow in the garden, of course, they don't last. And you need to do some pruning and some cutting down. And just as flowers in these verses fail and they fade, even trees as well. And Isaiah says in 6 to 8 that people are like that. People are like flowers and plants of the field and grass that wither and fade and don't last. Verse 6, a voice says, cry out. And I said, presumably the prophet Isaiah, what shall I cry? All men are like grass. All their glory is like the flowers of the field. How is that? Well, they wither and they fall. There are two problems with people. One is they're not reliable. Sooner or later, even the best people tend to let you down. The other is that they don't last. And the most comforting, the most encouraging people in your life, husband or wife perhaps, a best friend, they don't last most obvious thing to say, isn't it? Um, I got great comfort in that sense from my mother when she was alive. Um, She was a source of great encouragement. If I was struggling with something, I would just ring her up. She'd give me another point of view. And almost always, whatever she said, I would feel stronger afterwards. I think the advice usually ended with put the kettle on, and that was probably part of it. Put the kettle on. But she was a comfort. She was pretty reliable as well. But to state the obvious, even those closest to us, my mother. She doesn't last. The word of God does last. So when he says sin is paid for, it's completely paid for. And when he says I'm going to come to you, he definitely will and has in Jesus, however long it may seem to take for awaiting people. The word of God is lasting and remember, no one else is. Your spouse, your colleague, your closest friend, they won't cut it for you in life-giving strength. God does work through them, of course, but they will not last forever. 
as the word of God does. And then the last reason to know comfort, it's 9 to 11 in our passage. It's because the sovereign God is the shepherd. 9 to 11 is another big announcement, and the announcement is the end of verse 9. Here is your God. Literally, see your God. And see what God is like, this God who's arrived. Verse 10, see the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. The sovereign Lord comes with power. That means that the God of Israel, the God who seems so small and weak while you're in exile, him, the Lord, is the God who rules everything. He rules over the big things like the disaster of going off to Babylon and he rules over the tiny things like a spider spinning his web or whatever it might be. He's the sovereign Lord in other words. And that Lord, says Isaiah, is coming in power. His arm is ruling. That means his personal strength in action. I can't help thinking of Popeye, if you remember Popeye. Bulging muscles. He'll defeat everyone else. And the Lord is coming to carry out his salvation plans. He's going to sort things out finally. And verse 10, do you see as well, he's coming with his reward. His recompense accompanies him. So when God comes, he's going to bring his prize. You wonder what on earth would that be? God's prize? Is that a huge amount of money? Is that the holiday of more than a lifetime? Doesn't sound quite right. Well, then you see his reward in verse 11. And you see the surprise of it, because he's coming with a flock of sheep. Verse 11, this sovereign, powerful Lord tends his flock like a shepherd. And as you just go carefully through verse 11, do you see all the things that the best shepherds do? He gathers the lambs in his arms, because sometimes lambs are very weak and very discouraged and very tired and very cold. He carries them close to his heart. He's not just in it for the job. He's emotionally involved in his people and their care. And that last line, he gently leads those that have young. So he knows exactly the needs of each one. And he attends to those needs with perfect knowledge and perfect individual tailored help. The sovereign God is your shepherd. And the mighty arm that executes the plan is the tender arm that carries the lambs. Here is your God. I think one of the things that goes wrong for us as Christians is when life is difficult and we start to think of God wrongly. Because there's pressure, there is strain, there is too much to do, people's expectations to meet. Your heart is raging over something in particular and we start to think of God wrongly. And we need to keep hearing all that the Bible says about him and keep that firmly in place. It's not unlike last week, Isaiah chapter 6, do you remember? He's the holy, holy, holy Lord Almighty. Unfathomably different from you and me in greatness and in goodness. And he's wonderfully merciful. And here we've got to keep 10 and 11 together. Look at it again. 10 and 11 are not at odds with each other. The sovereignly powerful Lord is the gentle and tender shepherd. He rules every part of our lives and he's concerned for every part of our lives. The sovereign God is the shepherd. Just tease that out in your mind. If he's only the shepherd God in our thinking, of course he's going to, to lack the power to change anything. And in your life and mine, we're at the mercy of every circumstance that happens. God is somehow hamstrung by the way the dice falls. But he's the sovereign shepherd. His arm rules. He can change things. He is working a plan. Flip it round. If he's only the sovereign God, well, he doesn't know or care about the detail of my life. He's removed from reality. He's untouched by all that happened last week and all that will happen this week. But he's the sovereign shepherd. He's tender and caring enough to be involved. God's word does indeed stand forever because verses 10 to 11 has been fulfilled as you know. 
God came in sovereign power and tender care in the person of Jesus Christ. Some of them are here, but um, we had a lovely time at home group this week, just mulling over, kind of splashing around in the life of Jesus again. And we asked ourselves two questions. First was, where do you see the sovereign power of God in Jesus' life? And quick as a flash, someone said, the calming of the storm. Howling gale, very stormy sea. Jesus simply says to the weather, be quiet, be still. And it was. His arm rules for him. That is executive power. That is creator control. And then someone else in the group, they mentioned, oh yeah, raising someone from the dead. Little girl, I say to you, arise. Lazarus, come out. And as you may have done in your small group, you then ask the other question, where do we see the tender care of God in Jesus' life? And we thought about those same events where you see his sovereign power. So as he commands the storm... He says to troubled friends, why are you so afraid? I know how you're feeling. I know what you need. Do you still have no faith? And as he speaks to the corpse of a young girl, he says to the distraught father, don't be afraid. Trust me. And at the grave of Lazarus, he's already wept with the family. He's the shepherd who holds nothing back ultimately because to the friends of Jesus like Peter who say, I don't know Jesus, the same Jesus says, I will still die for you. The shepherd who lays down his life gladly and graciously because they don't deserve it. Here is your God and here is your comfort. Do you know Jesus Christ as your life-giving strength? Jesus is the mighty God whose heart goes out to his cherished people in all their different troubles and trials. Jesus is the ruler of everything who carries his people close to his heart. Do you know Jesus as your life-giving strength? Or are you still chasing elsewhere for comfort? You won't find it in a change of work or a move of house. You will not find it in more time with your spouse or the next holiday. You won't find it in reassessing and sorting out your priorities again. They may or may not be helpful things to do. They cannot deliver life-giving strength and eternal comfort. Only in Jesus is sin paid for. Only in Jesus has the glory of God come. Only in Jesus does God's word prove to stand forever. Only in Jesus do we see the sovereign God as tender shepherd. Here is your God. Here is your comfort. Amen.